Hi, this is Paul. You might notice it's daytime in the office. I've actually got the puppy here in a crate and she's being good. So let's see if I can do a little bit of video work. Um, release this video. And again, these, for those of you who are unacquainted with the channel, my videos are processes or processes, if I were in Canada, of exploration where when I'm interacting with these videos, I'm thinking out loud and I usually come up with some new insights and Part of what I was getting at in this video was Jordan Peterson as a public theologian. And given the evidence of the Exodus series, the Genesis series, he is very much doing public theology. And if so, what kind of public theology? And in this video, I talked about Peterson and Reinhold Niebuhr. Now, I, I know a number of people <laughs> who listen to my videos have never heard of Reinhold Niebuhr. He was probably the most important American theologian, churchman of the middle 20th century. Now, Karl Barth would have been probably the most important Protestant theologian of the 20th century. Um, I'll leave, leave Catholics and Orthodox to debate uh, from their own teams. But uh, notice there's a, there's a resonance here between what Peterson's doing and what Reinhold Niebuhr had done. Now, again, those of you who follow my channel notice that I'm at least as much interested in history as I am in theology. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr quite famously penned the Serenity Prayer, which is far better known than he is because of its popularization through 12-step programs. And so then I was beginning to think about Jordan Peterson's relationship to neo-orthodoxy. And again, neo-orthodoxy, that would be a term that many of you are unfamiliar with, but fortunately... Our friend Jordan B. Cooper, I did. I thought, I wonder what there is on YouTube about neo-orthodoxy. And Jordan P. Cooper came right up, and he has this, this nice treatment of the development of the quest for the historical Jesus into neo-orthodoxy, into Rudolf Bultmann, who most of you have never heard of, and into then Karl Barth. And I think a lot of this has a lot to do with Peterson. Now, of course, Peterson gets a lot of his thinking from Heidegger, from Jung, from Nietzsche, and Jung and Karl Barth are basically contemporaries, and they're coming out of the same milieu. They're addressing many of the same issues. Both of them come out of the Reformed camp. Carl, um, uh, Carl Jung's uh, father, again, a Reformed minister. Um, Karl Barth coming out of the Reformed camp in, in Germany. And, of course, with the Second World War, then into Switzerland, as many people did. So there's a, there's a lot going on here. So, actually, a little walk through uh, Jordan's treatment is helpful. Now, the first 24 minutes is all the quest for the historical Jesus, which, if, you've, if you know nothing about this, it's very helpful. And what's interesting about it is that it, in many ways... You can, if you listen to that, you can get a sense of the tensions that are in the conversation with Peterson and Peugeot and Ferveke with respect to not so much wanting to debate the intricacies of the degree to which I'm going to use, we could use modernist history, but I'm going to use physicalist history. The concern of physical history, physicalist history with respect to Jesus, because the quest for a historical Jesus assumes a certain definition of history. And that definition of history is itself changing right now with respect to what we understand history to mean. And meaning, because a big part of peak modernity, the concern was over let's say, physicalist relationships. That was the concern. We want to know where Jesus was when he met the, this blind man on the road to Jericho. Um, was, there, was there one blind man or two blind men? Those of you who know a little bit of uh, the Bible might can, can look this up. The synoptic problem. And this, of course, goes all the way down into questions of Historicity, and again, when we're using history that light that way, we're talking about modernist physicalist history, and so the concern was that well, we have to we have to find the historical we have to find what really happened, and again, when you hear historians say what really happened, 
they prioritize the physical level. Now, part of what now at the end of post-modernity and perhaps the wrestling with meta-modernity we're dealing with is, well, the physical is only one layer. That's, let's say, the propositional. And there's the other. There's the, there's the procedural. There's the... <laughs> John's four Ps. There's the procedural. There's the uh, participatory. There's the, uh, I can never get all four at the same time, but you can look them up. Um, but it's the other three Ps. It's all of this that we're living in the midst of that, that tends to matter to us at least as much and sometimes more than just the physicalist layer. And of course, I think there's a lot of technological things that are moving us in these directions. So, so he introduces here the quest to the historical Jesus because, well, can we get back to find you know, what, what exactly really happened? But as, as, as Jordan B. Cooper notes, as many other noted, the quest for the historical Jesus uh, was found bankrupt mostly because what it was discovered was that each of these questers basically reconstructed a Jesus in their own image. And, and this has been a continual, and I think Jordan makes a nice point of it, this has been a continual issue with, uh, uh, how, can, how can I, with modernist theologians, with, he says, liberal theologians. Again, part of what's, part of what we're dealing with right now is the words are moving around because if you said liberal 30 years ago in the Christian form context, you would have heard basically what Jordan is talking about. Today, liberal means sort of classical liberalism, so we put that other word in front of it to sort of differentiate it. And and so a lot of our fights right now are about those kinds of issues. But these, these theological fights going on underneath that very few people pay attention to, if you've got some theological training and you go into a church, you can sort of hear them going on in the background of the church, and they sort of filter then into the church, and they get popularized in people's ideas. And I read them in the comment section all the time. Well, what does it matter what actually happened in physical history, what this means is, and this is the mythology of, and so on and so on and so on. So a little bit of historical survey would be very helpful, I think, for a lot of people because they'd say, Oh, and, and I can see why we're talking about what we're talking about. And then you can begin to get, I think, some, I think you can get some idea. You can sort of locate Jordan Peterson in this longer history of theological development. And again, part of what you begin to see is that the terms continue to change. And someone like Jordan is very interesting because it's through him that you can see the terms changing. And it's also because, in a sense, the the usual manner of filtration that this has had is uh, young men go to seminary. Their professors um, indoctrinate them and, and raise their consciousness with whatever new theological ideas are there and their arguments. The seminarians go out into the church and start preaching. Now, this, this often goes different ways. Uh, brought up Abraham Kuyper. Kuiper, of course, was one of many who, let's say, went to liberal, uh, went to a liberal, got a liberal theological education, and then went into the church and discovered that his liberal theological education was practically useless. In fact, it was counterproductive in terms of actually helping people with their lives, who are much more living in the other three P's than they are just in the propositional P. So let's do some listening to this video by Jordan B. Cooper, and that'll give you a little sense of what was going on theologically in the 20th century. On to uh, the second part of our discussion. Uh, we're going to be speaking about the ideas of Rudolf Bultmann and his relationship to Christology and questions of the historical Jesus. So uh, Rudolf Bultmann is one of the most significant theological figures in the 20th century. Uh, certainly up there with, with Karl Barth. He has a significant influence both in theology and in the world of New Testament scholarship. So, so Bultmann is, a, he's a New Testament scholar, uh, but he's also very much a philosopher theologian at the same time. So he has, he writes on a number of different issues and a number of different areas of, of thought. He even writes a little bit in his work about Luther and what Luther believed about certain things. And I think because of that, 
Uh, he has led to a lot of problems in interpretations of Luther because Bultmann, I think, very much doesn't get Luther. And when you look at somebody like N.T. Wright and authors involved in the new perspective on Paul, they tend to read Luther basically through the lens of Rudolf Bultmann. The point of all of that being, he's a very significant figure. Uh, all right, so Rudolf Bultmann's years are 1884 to 1976. And I mentioned before in the quest for the historical Jesus uh, that there is a, a divide within uh, this historical Jesus scholarship between a perceived divide between the Christ of history and the Christ of faith. And to, to understand Rudolf Bultmann's thought and the way that he views Christ, you have to understand the centrality of this division between the Christ of history and the Christ of faith. Now, Bultmann takes a statement from the Apostle Paul when he's writing to the Corinthians, uh, where the Apostle Paul says, we used to know Christ according to the flesh, we now know him thus no longer. And in Bultmann's view, what Paul is saying there essentially is we have this divide between there's this Christ of the flesh, this Christ of faith, but we're not concerned with that. We are concerned with the Christ that is in Christian proclamation. Okay, and right there you begin to see some of the divisions. And <laughs> just playing it this way, I can sort of know which some of you who are going to, there's the division. And the question is, Basically, Peterson's question, where does the mythological world and the phys where do the mythological world and the physical worlds meet? Where do they meet? That's, of course, Jordan's question. And, and you get that in the conversation with um, you get that in the conversation that Jordan has with Jonathan right after Jordan sort of re-enters public conversation while he's still quite sick. I mean, if you look at him in that video, it's like, oh, wow. And, and then you begin to see more and more now when he talks about it, he will say, well, this is where, this is where the worlds meet. And so for Jordan, these worlds are coming together. But when Boltman is talking, it's just a foregone conclusion that the the mythological world has passed away, and but in a sense, all we have left is the mythological, and so now it becomes the moral. But but when the moral is disconnected from the physical world, does it really make any sense? So essentially for Boltmann, theology is not concerned with the historicity of the events of Jesus's life. Uh, instead, theology is, is really concerned with the personal encounter that one has with Jesus in the kerygma, meaning the, in the preaching, the proclamation of the word of God to the individual one encounter. Okay, now this encounter again, this is sort of the this is sort of the eternity in the now, let's call it that. And it's that moment of transformation. It's that moment of insight. It's the entering into the flow state. We can use these cognitive science terms. It's, the, it's this moment when suddenly there's a transformation. And again, if you listen to you know, Peterson or, or, or many others, that, that's, that's the thing we care about. We care about the transformation. But then you're going to have to ask, transformed into what? Because certainly we love getting into that flow state. It's a moment of transformation can be exhilarating. It can also be painful and terrifying. There's, of course, mortification. The, and Peterson talks about this in terms of the dead wood being burned off. But then there's also the exhilaration of, of let's say, new agency. Um, new agency. But, but And this is, again, where Peterson is sort of a quester because you go all the way back to that first conversation he had about the resurrection with a reporter, and and Peterson continues to ask the same question, which is, I don't know how far this goes in terms of this agency. And, you know, I haven't read a lot of Jung, but if you read this sort of autobiography of Jung that seemed to be kind of put together by some of his followers, one of the most interesting chapters is when Jung is meeting with Freud. Freud is sort of his mentor, and Jung is supposed to sort of take the baton from Freud, but Jung goes in some directions that Freud doesn't feel um, are appropriate. And and part of, and, and so Jung gets into, I mean, this whole passage of the report of the cabinet, basically 
Jung predicts something that's going to happen. And, and so in this sense, Jung himself sort of crosses this boundary. You know, we can't just stay mythological. We can't just keep it all in the upper register. It's got to come down to earth and it's got to change. And, and certainly it changes earth through us. But does it have, and this is where you get sort of what haunts modernity, which is the miraculous. There's Christ, but this is not the Christ of his in the kerygma, meaning the, in the preaching, the proclamation of the word of God to the individual one encounters Christ. But this is not the Christ of history that one is encountering. This is the Christ of the Christian faith or of the Christian message. Uh, so Boltmann does acknowledge the historicity of the person of Jesus, to be clear. He's not a Jesus mythologist in the full sense of the term, though he talks about mythology, but not in, not in quite that way. Um, he acknowledges that there are three particular historical facts that we know for sure about Jesus's life. And they're, it's pretty simple. One is Jesus existed. Boltmann does speak about the importance of the particularity of the person of Christ, the thatness of Jesus. So we have to have a one that we can point to and say that is Jesus. He, this Jesus preached, he was a preacher, and he died on a cross under Rome. That's basically it for Boltmann. As long as you have these three basic historical facts, that's kind of all you need really uh, for the Christian message. So uh, again, to say that he has this emphasis then instead of on the historicity of events, the historical actual events of the life of Jesus, uh, instead the focus is on the proclamation of Jesus and how we encounter Jesus within the proclamation in the church. Now, Boltman's ideas are probably most famously known through one essay that he writes uh, on the New Testament and uh, mythology, and that's the name of the essay. It's called New Testament and Mythology. And he comes up with this idea of, of demythologization. Essentially, what Rudolf Boltman is going to say is that the creedal doctrinal formulae of about Jesus and about the life of Jesus, but not just about Jesus, about the reality of heaven and hell and all of the very supernatural elements of Christianity. This is all, these are mythological layers that contain within them this kernel of basic truth underneath the mythology. To be clear, what Bultmann is saying is not that the mythology is bad. He's saying there's truth in the mythology but the truth is couched under mythological ideas and language. So for Boltman, the Christian theologian must engage in this process of what he calls demythologization. So in, in this demythologization, we have to look at the truth claims of Christianity, the basic message of Christianity. Now, now part of what you have to ask is, okay, what do you mean by truth? And, and again, this tends to be still in very much the tyranny of the propositional. That we have to sort of demythologize the text, but then the kinds of truths we get out of it are wisdom. They're sort of eternal in that they're not contextual or situational. They would have to be applied to situations, but, but you see this in, you can see this in even let's say conservative theology, where the truth would be uh, principles, something like that. And the, the truth, again, is sort of a timeless thing. And, and again, I'm not critical of this kind of truth or skeptical of this kind of truth, but understand sort of the, it's not making claims in other registers that, again, by virtue of the history, people want to say the Bible can't make claims in those registers. And then kind of untangle what that base, basic message is from the ancient mythological worldview that he says now as modern people we can reject. So what Boltman is trying to do in many ways is similar to what someone like Schleiermacher was trying to do. He's trying to say that there is still relevance for Christianity today in the modern world. And even though nowadays we know that those mythological elements, Boltman's going to say, are false, we know that a lot of the supernatural claims of Christianity are false because us modern people understand the world better than you know ancient first century Jews did. Uh, so we can discard that, but we don't have to discard Christianity. So we can still 
we could hold on to a kind of anti-supernaturalism and hold on to Christianity at exactly the same time. So and, and I've spoken about this before. This is an enormous concern in the modern period because the, the concern is that, well, we modern people, because of the radical revision that the uh, enlightenment had done sort of it sort of how can i say this cleansing relics and rituals of their enchantment and power well now we somehow have to save christianity because there's so many there's so much sunk cost in the thing that without it we don't know where we're going and of course, looking back on it now, we can we can look back and say, you know, via Tom Holland. Well, <laughs> the, the the truth is, even when people stopped believing in the efficacy of the Lord's Supper or the preaching of the Word or the power of the Bible or all of these things, they, they were still so deeply embedded in Christianity. And and so, I mean, part of part of what happened is there was just sort of this top little crust of society of of people who you know had to had to you know got a good education and things and of course it was all the the simple people who continued to believe in the mythology but those who knew better didn't believe and so on and so forth and and you know we ran all through this history and it it basically has has run its course so that, that's what Boltman is trying uh, to do here with this whole demythologization project. Um, so I'm going to uh, look a little bit here um, at this, this particular text of Boltman to read some of you what, what he's trying to say. Um, this particular text is called Kerygma and Rith by Myth uh, by uh, Rudolf Boltman and Five Critics. This is a helpful volume, and I don't know if this thing is still in print. I got this at a used bookstore in Massachusetts uh, years ago, but... Um, this this contains the famous essay of Bultmann, and it has a bunch of other New Testament scholars responding to Bultmann's essay and critiquing it, and then Bultmann gives responses as well. So it, it's a helpful volume if you want to understand basically where it is that Bultmann is coming from. Uh, the New Testament mythology essay that is central to what Bultmann is getting at here is, is not very long. I'm looking at how long exactly. It's like 44 pages, it looks like. Um, so it's not that long. And it's pretty easy to, to read through to get the basic idea of what Bultmann is trying to do. Uh, but I'm just going to read a little bit of the beginning so you see what he's trying to get at. This is on page one of this book. All right. Uh, the cosmology of the New Testament is essentially mythical in character. The world is viewed as a three-storied structure, with the earth in the center, the heaven above, and the underworld beneath. Heaven is the abode of God and celestial beings, the angels. The underworld is hell, the place of torment. Even the earth is more than the scene of the natural. Sorry for a little face. I had to find my mouse, and my mouse wasn't going where I wanted it to. So again, two worlds mythology, mythology sort of, well, the different people have three-level universes. Sometimes it's earth, middle realm, like angelic realm, and then God. Uh, this is um, hell, earth heaven natural everyday events of the trivial rounded common task it is the scene of the supernatural activity of god and his angels on the one hand and of satan and his demons on the other these supernatural forces intervene in the course of nature and in all that men think and will and do miracles are by no means rare man is not in control of his own life evil spirits may take possession of him satan may inspire him with evil thoughts Alternately, God may inspire his thoughts and guide his purposes. He may grant him heavenly visions. He may allow him to hear his word of succor or demand. He may give him the supernatural power of his spirit. History does not follow a smooth, unbroken course. It is set in motion and controlled by these supernatural powers. This aeon is held in bondage by Satan, sin, and death. For, quote, powers is precisely what they are and hastens toward its end. That end will come very soon and will take the form of a cosmic catastrophe. It will be inaugurated by the woes of the last time. Then the judge will come from heaven. The dead will rise. The last judgment will take place and men will enter into eternal salvation or damnation. Now, you hear all of that and you may hear that and say, OK, I believe that a lot of that is true. Um, certainly when we're when we're reading this, when he talks about the. Uh, this kind of mythological view of the threefold structure of the universe, that there is a literal, and here you're going to have the, the idea mostly of a kind of flat earth with a, a domed canopy 
the kind of common ancient Near Eastern view of of Earth and, and basic um, ancient Near Eastern cosmology, and that uh, that hell is literally below, and that heaven is literally above. Uh, and those aspects or elements of mythology. There's the L word. And again, I, I want to get rid of that L word and put in a P word that hell is physically below and physically above. Because, again, part of what we see, and it's so fun reading this, because, of course, Boltman is living in a different world. And Boltman, of course, believed he wasn't living in a different world. He was living in the world. But a, a much deeper understanding of pluralism understands that everyone has a culture. Everyone has a world. And there are struggles with that world. And I don't know if you feel the same thing I feel. But what's amazing is that listening to this, these are, these are sort of like, so some often before the puppy, once the puppy gets big enough. I like exercising by the levee in Sacramento. And so there's this levee runs up and down the Sacramento River. And it's a great place to, it's a great place. To, there's a path, everybody walks, walks their dogs, rides bikes, et cetera, et cetera. And in the river, it's, of course, when you're in the middle of water, it's, it's hard to know where you are or what's going on. Every now and then there'll be like an old pier that sits up out of the water. The, these things are sort of like piers and you can sort of know where you are with respect to it by virtue of the pier. And, and listening to Boltman, you know, remembering, we didn't treat Boltman a lot in seminary. Again, it was a conservative reformed seminary. So they looked at Boltman and said, quite reasonably, this isn't going to do you much good at all. You should at least know who the character is and what happened around him. But uh, in terms of helping normal people in their everyday life, this will be practically useless. Certainly most Christians, unless you're a strict flat earther and those people exist. I guess they still exist. I think most of them became QAnon and gave up on Flat Earth, at least in my experience, but uh, if they're still around, any of you around. Um, but most of us recognize, obviously there are mythological, um, and I wouldn't call it mythological, but there are, um, well, there is an element of myth. You know, C.S. Lewis does talk about Christianity as the true myth. So there, there, there's some truth to this, that there is, there are parallels between myths of various cultures and in Christianity, and some of that, I think. And, and again, a lot of what we've been working on in the corner is to up our, up our resolution with respect to what on earth we mean by this, this word myth. Well, myth is this framing story that sort of helps us navigate in the world. Myth is, is your, your myth is something very close to, let's say, your religion. Um, they, they function together. And, of course, when Lewis says it's a true myth, Lewis is going to say, I'm skeptical, and if you read his book, Miracles, um, deeply skeptical about Rudolf, the world Rudolf Boltman is living in. It's just not really tenable, um, and it's not tenable for most of humanity and never has been. And then, of course, in many ways, Lewis will go on to describe the world as he sees it. And, and that's what all of our conversations do. We're all trying to get the world accurately in terms of these maps we have inside that they relate to the world outside in a productive way so that we can have agency I think is very is very purposeful but christianity is kind of the truth of uh, or the truth behind these mythologies that show up in various cultures um lewis marcos's book on greek mythology and the ties between greek mythology and the christian myth as the true myth is really good if you want to get uh, a look at that. I'm forgetting the title of the book, but uh, look up Lewis Marcos and you'll be able to find that. An author on literature and deals with classical education stuff um, and, and whatnot. But obviously there is some kind of symbolic language involved in the Christian proclamation because it is true that, you know, up is where God is. That is biblical imagery. For example, God is encountered often on mountains so that there is, you know, Moses going up Mount Sinai. There is this picture of the ascent up to God so, so that upwardness has this imagery. And of course, if you listen to the Exodus seminar, this is what we're majoring in now again, isn't it? This is so interesting that 
Well, the symbolic has come back in. And of course, um, Heidegger's a big, a big piece of this, phenomenology. And it's interesting how Boltmann, with his appropriation of Heidegger, takes it in a radically different way. And now these new appropriations of Heidegger are taking it in the other way. That's trying to, to get something that is true across to us. And, and using a human kind of picture or analogy of, of moving up as a, a kind of transcending the, to the realm where God is, um, which is why we also have the Sermon on the Mount on a mountain. We have the temple on a mountain. We have Jesus's death on a mountain that brings us into the presence of, of God ultimately. So we have this, this kind of imagery. And so we can see when we look at Boltman, okay, well, there's a little bit of truth to what he's saying in that, yeah, it's true that there are kind of symbolic things that God uses to speak to or communicate things to us. Um, but Boltman is going far beyond that and basically saying that all of the basic elements of Christianity are nothing more than myth that we're to find the kernel underneath. So all of this. And again, listening to this, I, I could sort of listen to it through different iterations of myself over the years. And I, I can see how my view of symbolism has changed. And I can sort of understand where Boltman is at. And I mean, Jordan and I, we, on Twitter, we were, oh, we should talk again. And then the puppy came into my life and, um, so I have to have another conversation with Jordan. And this, this might be someone wanted us to talk about etiquette. Um, he, he obviously does more groom beard, beard grooming than I do, but so I, I'm probably not the best person to talk about etiquette. But, but you can see how these things are changing. Even just listening to, to Jordan talk here, you can just have, I just have a sense of how the valence of these words are changing quickly that he's described here, uh, whereas most of us would probably say that, okay, yeah, heaven is not literally up, hell is not literally below, and then there's a flat earth in between. But the rest of the pre Physically. presentation of what Boltman gives is kind of the just historic biblical narrative. I mean, there, there's a real end of the world, that there are real angels and real evil spirits. So you'd say, yeah, that, that's all very true. I mean, this is the essence of the Christian faith. And of course, part of what's happening to this corner is, well, let's talk about what we mean by spirit. Let's talk about what we mean by angels and and demons and where does Descartes fit into this? And is there are are demons made up and all of an alternative substance from the substance that we are made up? And what exactly is this substance? Do angels and demons and humans live in the same universe? If so, how? How do we relate to one another? And then where is God in this? Is God just another thing in the universe? I mean, this is this is where we've been going for, for how long in this corner? And Boltman is going to say that all of that can be essentially discarded. So he says this, then following this, uh, th this then is the mythical view of the world, which the New Testament presupposes when it presents the event of redemption, which is the subject of its preaching. So the redemption that is the subject of its preaching, that's the thing that he is going to say applies even to us today. But we have to get rid of that mythological worldview. And, and, and then you're going to have to ask Boltman, well, what exactly is the nature of this salvation anyway? We can now import that basic idea behind the preaching into um, our worldview today. All right. It proclaims in the language of mythology that the last time has now come. In the fullness of time, God set forth his son. Remember, this is what he's, not, he's saying is not true. A preexistent divine being who appears on earth as a man. He dies the death of a sinner on the cross and makes atonement for the sins of men. His resurrection marks the beginning of the cosmic catastrophe. Death, the consequence of Adam's sin, is abolished, and the demonic forces are deprived of their power. The risen Christ is exalted to the right hand of God in heaven and made Lord and King. He will come again in the clouds of heaven to complete the work of redemption, and the resurrection and judgment of men will follow. Sin, suffering, and death will then be finally abolished. All this is to happen very soon. Indeed, St. Paul thinks that he himself will live to see it. All who belong to Christ's church and are joined to the Lord by baptism in the Eucharist are certain of resurrection to salvation unless they forfeit it by unworthy behavior. Christian believers already enjoy the first installment of salvation for the Spirit is at work within them, bearing witness to their adoption as sons of God and guaranteeing the final resurrection. 
Um, okay. So this all sounds like the, the basic summary of like what this is the point of Christianity. Here's the kind of your your Apostles Creed, right? Here is your basic events of like what makes Christianity Christianity. And all of that Boltman is couching under mythology. <laughs> All of it, like everything that is essential to Christianity here, he's saying all of that is mythology. Now, now it's helpful because, again, this sort of sets up the modernist fundamentalist fight. It sets up those who would say, OK, we're going to demythologize it. And what tends to be left is morality and politics. And so now it's something watching the the Palestinian. <laughs> you've got the you've got the the Israeli-Palestinian war on the ground in the physical world, and you've got the Israeli-Palestinian war in the air in the cyber world. And it's even in the comment section, it's just amazing watching, and even on CRC Voices, it's just amazing that people step up and here they're going to, this is what I think. Oh, no, you're wrong. And, and it's like, okay, participation. What are we participating in when we do this? And, and so what happens with this radical demythologization is all you basically have left is ethics, which leads to politics, and that's it. But again, those religious layers underneath are still churning and still manifesting themselves. And, and, but then, of course, you've got more of the, on the fundamentalist side, say, no, this is true. We're expecting the second coming of Jesus, and we're expecting to have a, an experiential heaven. And if you look at the Pierce Morgan convert, you know, question with Jordan Peterson, all of those questions that Pierce Morgan is asking, th these are all taken from the 20th century fight book of, well, I could just show you, because it's Pierce Morgan has never been initiated into this formally, consciously, but by virtue of his culture, by virtue of his mapping, he's initiated into it. So, so watch how this conversation goes. I really believe that. But what do you think? I mean, you, you've had moments in your life in recent years, or I would imagine you have faced the prospect of potentially dying. And in those moments, yeah. in those moments, what have you felt? And what do you think happens to you if you do die or you had died what what did you imagine might happen to you now, now what's so interesting here is that if he wanted to he could play exactly the same game and i don't mean game dismissively he could play exactly the same game that he does with the question of belief in god because for jordan when I made the video before, I mean, there's there's a ton of existentialism in here, and P Cooper's going to talk about that because that's where this goes in the 20th century. It goes into existentialism because okay, if we've sort of thrown out the mythological symbolic language, and we no longer take that seriously, and the 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 history of the physical Jesus doesn't really matter that much. Just his words, just the impact of the of the kerugma, of the of the preaching, of the proclamation, of the. I mean, when you read Karl Barth, you just have this sense of moments of transformation that come upon you at the. You know, it's very existentialist. Now, Peterson's caught in all of this trap here, and I don't know. I doubt he's ever read any Boltman. I he certainly knows Jung. He knows Heidegger, he knows Nietzsche, so he's, he's aware of the terrain, but he's not, I, I wouldn't imagine, terribly aware of the, the theological, of, of how this has sort of worked its way through. But it's... Well, at the, I had lots of moments, moments, years in the last few years where dying would have been an absolute relief. And had that been accompanied by the complete cessation of my being, I would have been perfectly content with that. There are things that are far worse than dying. So if you're only terrified of dying, you've hardly begun to plumb the depths of existential catastrophe. <laughs> well, de death, death is fairly... You just don't have an imagination. What could be worse than dying? Being a prison guard at Auschwitz? But you'd still be alive, even if you were witnessing horror. It's not death that the oh, ultimate... Oh, no, I'm thinking perpetrating it. Right. You mean carrying... how about a, how about being an Auschwitz guard? At a, how about being an Auschwitz guard who really enjoyed his job? Yeah. 
How about that? That's worse than death. I, I don't know if Morgan gets him here. As far as I'm concerned. Right. I mean that. No, no, I, I see that. That's hell, man. Yeah, it's a living hell. That's hell. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. But do you think there so, is? But do you so, think there's an actual hell, Jordan? Is it? Is there somewhere that people like that go to, which is? See, okay, physical. Now we're back. See, you see these fights going on and all of these talks. Even if you could say Boltman between them, and they'd say who? Rudolf Boltman. Don't you know who Rudolf Boltman is? I have no idea. Should I? Hell. Oh, definitely. Now, what, what relationship that has to what happens to you when you die, I have no idea. I mean, I don't think anybody's in a position to speak about what's truly beyond our ken, let's say. I don't think we... Un this is part of the reason of the language about Jesus in terms of where he came from. You read the Gospel of John. Well, where are you from? Well, he's the man from heaven. And, well, Jesus has insider information with respect to things but um i mean this is this is all the issues they're all right here understand consciousness at all we don't understand time we don't understand the relationship between finitude and in, and 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 the infinite landscape that surrounds us that's all a great mystery and i tend to leave that alone because i try not to speak about things that i can't speak about but does and this, that's where peterson is he tries to leave that alone in terms of this one register, um, let's say the physicalist register. Does hell exist? It's like, study history and see if you can figure it out for yourself. I mean, does, does heaven there's exist? Nothing, there's nothing that's more obvious than that hell exists. So does, mean, does heaven exist? Mao's China was hell. Right, but does, so you're talking about hell on earth, but do you believe there's a hell after death? Like I said, I, I, I can't, I can't, I don't speculate about such things. I don't, that's where my ignorance finds its, what would you say? That's where my knowledge finds its limit. No. I'm, I'm concerned enough about what I'm doing right now, right here, and, and leaving the rest of that. And, you know. And, and this has been Jordan's consistent answer. And I think when you get into the question about God, this is part of the reason he says this is private. In other words, in that sense, he continues to be a very much in the modern frame because modernity can talk about this, and then you watch this in these old uh, PBS and even new ones. This is the Jesus of faith, and this is the Jesus of history, and you sort of put the things in two different boxes and leave them separate. I'm not, so I have to leave it at that. The hell that I see as a potential on earth is sufficient as a deterrent and it's of, of sufficient reality. You know, you can ask, well, is it eternal? Well, then I would say, well, look, all totalitarian states are variants on a theme, let's say, and that theme persists. All archetypal stories are eternal. Everything that happened in the Bible happened and is happening and will continue to happen forever. It's part of the- And there's a sense in which, again, this is neo-orthodoxy. This is Boltman, and this is Bart. So what's amazing is that the, again, Reinhold Niebuhr, a neo-orthodox theologian in the middle of 20th century, this sort of went, you know, th this had a grip in the 20th century. You know, what is... There's, there's a degree to which the Church of Jordan Peterson is like the mainline church that has almost disappeared but but it's sort of a a a, a it's sort of a a reinstantiation of it a reliving of it but but its political valence is different and but but it's you know it, it's sort of filled with people that say i i don't know about let's say phenomenological after death experience but Hell in this world should be a sufficient warning. The eternal human story, it's hyper real. And, and heaven and hell are part of that. Mm -hmm. What that means in the final analysis, I don't know. I mean, you asked, I think you asked in there, you know, there, hell is real, is heaven real? It's like, mm -hmm. well, heaven is as far away from hell as you can get. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of thinking about right. it. Um, I've spent my whole life trying to determine how you get as far away from 
being a camp guard at Auschwitz who enjoys his job as possible. And one of the things, one of the things I've realized in recent years, for example, is that you are far from that if you're engaging in your interactions with the world in the spirit of voluntary play. You know, and we're playing during this conversation, and Joe Rogan plays on his podcast all the time. And if you're in a playful state with your wife, your marriage is optimized. And the state of play is the opposite of tyranny. And that's why it says in the Gospels that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like a little child. So you want to reinstate that, that open eyed, wide-eyed acceptance of life that is the precursor to voluntary play. You want to develop your character to the point where that's part and parcel of your life on an ongoing basis. And that's allowing that spirit of the logos to inhabit you. That's another way of thinking about it. And you can, you can certainly aid that with prayer. You know, people don't understand. People think of God as the joke is a cosmic butler. You pray to have your wishes granted. It's like, he's not a genie. You want, to pr you want to pray? It's like, pray about your stupidity. Here's a prayer that'll work for sure. You want to see if prayer works? Here's one. This will work. Sit on the edge of your bed. Ask yourself, what bloody stupid thing do I continue to do that's making my life more miserable than it has to be and everyone else's life around me that I could give up, that I would give up? And, but you have to really want the answer. So you open yourself up in humility to a revelation. Mm. You'll get an answer. It won't be one you want. That's how you'll know it's true. <laughs> but if you act on it, then your life will improve. And that's a proper prayer. Yeah. That's, that's what you do. Like in a metaphysical sense, the Christian insistence that you should be aware of your sins, you know, which is in, sense, in a sense an existential burden, is also the idea that you should attend to your own inadequacies and admit to them because in doing so, you open up the possibility that something better can make itself manifest within you. Now, now notice what he's just done in the conversation. He's just taken Pierce Morgan far enough afield that the, the, the sort of the little game in, in modernity, the modernist fundamentalist game, Pierce Morgan has sort of lost sight of that because Jordan has given him application in a sense in a neo-orthodox context, in an existentialist frame that is practical and spiritual because it involves something like prayer. And so th there's a very s real sense in which, in, in some ways, he is, he is, it, it's fascinating because, of course, politically, the the mainline church freaks out about Jordan Peterson because of the hit job done on him from uh, from the from the blue church from the cathedral. But there there's a real sense in which Jordan is very much of that milieu, but yet not. And I think that's where you begin to see you see the recession of modernity and you see how these conversations are changing. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much farther, but I want to read a little bit more of this essay so you see where, where he's getting at. Um, so he said, all this language of mythology, the origin of the various themes can be easily traced in the contemporary mythology of Jewish apocalyptic and in the redemption myths of Gnosticism. So what he's saying is he's grabbing onto what happens with Schweitzer, where you have this emphasis now, and this really begins with Reed, as I mentioned, but Schweitzer popularizes it. You have this emphasis on the continuity between the preaching of Jesus and first century Judaism, this recognition of the, the Jewish context in which Christianity as a religion first arises. And Boltman is taking that and saying, all of that is true. So we can say then that all of these elements we think of as being unique to Christianity, that's all just a Jewish first century worldview. But what's the question is kind of what's unique about Christianity underneath that. So he's saying it, it buys into the ancient mythological worldview. And then he says this, to this extent, the kerygma is incredible to modern man, for he is convinced that the mythical view of the world is obsolete. So he, what he's saying is, he's saying, well, modern man says all of that mythological stuff that you've talked about, basically the entirety of the Christian message, is obsolete. And Boltman is not saying then that what we need to do is convince man that those things are not obsolete and they're true. He's saying, 
we can, with modern man, say, okay, that might not, that's true that that is all obsolete, but here's another way to have the Christian message apart from. And, and then you can see where Jordan fits in that, because Jordan would not say that stuff is obsolete. He is saying, I am applying those things. But you've got someone like Pierce Morgan say, well, what do you mean about, basically, the question, Pierce, is far more difficult than you know, which is what he says to the God question, the hell question. Is it a place? Does my body go there? Well, we put our bodies in the ground. Well, is, but, but then, of course, you're going to bump right into the question of physicalism, which is, well, wait a minute, when there's the secession of my brain function, do I no longer have the apprehension of phenomenological experience? Uh, mythology. So he says, we are therefore bound to ask whether when we preach the gospel today, we expect our converts to accept not only the gospel message, but also the mythical view of the world in which it is set. Of course, the assumption being that there is some kind of message underneath that you could divorce from the historical events that make up the truth claims of Christianity. And I, I think you have a hard time doing that. Uh, Christianity, the, the, the see, you can just see that disembody. Well, we can disembody Christianity from the mythology and rescue it. But again, now that we've seen a century of what that rescue looks like, it looks like politics and morality. Biblical narrative is very much a narrative. I mean, it is so historically intertwined. This notion that you can find some kernel of truth just underneath the facts of history that's totally divorced from the facts of history uh, as presented in the biblical narrative, I think is so difficult uh, to, to hold. Um, so he says then, if, if it's true that we don't have to have this mythological background, he says, theology must undertake the task of stripping the kerygma from its mythical framework of demythologizing it. And then he asks, can Christian preaching expect modern man to accept the mythical view of the world is true? To do so would be both senseless and impossible. Okay. It would be senseless because... That, that, that's Boltman. Well, it's, you know, modernity is done. We're at the end of history. Here we are. We, we all know this, but then, of course, we stopped, on, we stopped all knowing it. There is nothing specifically Christian in the mythical view of the world, as such. It is simply the cosmology of a pre-scientific age. And, you know, you can read more on this, but but I think the point is rather clear in, in this part of the text. So what Boltman is saying is essentially you can, and we're relating this all to Christology, So, and I know we're going a little more broad in our approach to Christian theology, but because this is all concerned with the events of the life of Jesus, we're saying that Essentially, for Boltman, you can have a Christology that is devoid of any historical facts about Christ other than the fact that he just existed. <laughs> so you get rid of all the miracles, get rid of the resurrection, get rid of his death as the sacrifice for sins. Uh, you get rid of the preexistence of Jesus. You get rid of Trinitarian theology. You get rid of the two natures of Christ. You're left with nothing. OK, there's nothing Christian about the message at all. Um, Rudolf Boltman then seeks to find this kerygma or proclamation underneath it. Uh, which ends up sounding a lot like Martin Heidegger. Uh, the, Boltman was, uh, he studied Heidegger. Uh, Boltman was also a student of, of some neo-Kantian theologians, similar to how Albert Ritchell was in the past. So it's it's not fair to say, and some people just, there's a, Ralph McQuarrie has a, a book on Boltman and Heidegger comparing the two and, and making the argument that um, Boltman is essentially Christianizing Heidegger. And Boltman, uh, endorses that book. <laughs> so Boltman is saying, yeah, I have done this a lot. But Boltman also says, I'm not doing just a baptizing of Heidegger. Uh, Boltman thinks he's doing more than that. And, and and to some extent, it's true. There are significant, and Macquarie recognizes this in that text as well. There are significant points of divergence between Boltman and Heidegger. Um, but I think regardless of what those connections are, and I don't have time to get into all of that, that's kind of takes us beyond the, the subject of today. Um, but what is, I think, very clear is that the message that ends up appearing as gospel, devoid of any of the historical creedal Christianity, is something that is very similar to existentialism. It is the reality that what Butlin comes up with is something that is very much in the philosophical cultural milieu of the day. And I think he ends up coming to the same conclusion that Schweitzer is critiquing uh, the, the uh, 
historians who are trying to portray the life of Jesus before him as doing, which is taking Jesus and basically creating him in the image of what the author then believes and promotes in the modern day. So I think that's exactly what, what Boltman does. He comes down to essentially uh, the same position here. And the problem, of course, with that is if, if you're really into Jesus for the transformation, if what's after the transformation is just what you thought of all along in the first place, it's not much of a transformation. Now, of course, if you get into... Chad just had a really good video on Friday Morning Nameless uh, about transformation. Um, using an audio book of a book I hadn't heard of, but apparently is popular in 12-step groups. But what happens... Then, of course, in the 20th century as well, what a sin comes to the fore again. And I will just let Jordan talk as a walk through some of this. All right. So that's that's Rudolf Bultmann for you. Now uh, we are going to look at the next figure here. Oh, man, and I have a bunch more. So I'm probably going to have to divide this into two <laughs> programs here, which is uh, I thought I may because there is a lot going on in the 20th century, and I've just covered two things here <laughs> so far. Um, okay, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot in the 20th century. Theology develops in a bunch of different directions. I tend to think that not much is good in the 20th century. Uh, I, I really, and, and I know I'm, people accuse me of just uh, kind of romanticizing the past or something, and, and I don't like to think I'm just doing that, but... I really don't think much good comes out of the 20th century. It's not to say there's nothing good in the 20th century in theology, um, but there are a lot of philosophical basic assumptions that lead 20th century theology that are essentially, I think, totally mistaken. And if that's the case, it means that, you know, if your foundations are bad, the things that are built on the foundations are not going to have much worth either. So uh, <laughs> I, I tend to think that most 20th century theology, obviously there are exceptions, um, is I think we could have started in different directions in the beginning of the 20th century and would have ended up in a much better place. Okay, <laughs> I'll just say that. Uh, the next figure that we we have to discuss here, um, and I'm always hesitant to discuss him because of uh, the amount of disagreement over his ideas, uh, and that is Karl Barth. So Karl Barth, 1886 to 1968. There's no doubt that Karl Barth is the most influential theologian of the 20th century. I mean, it's really not even a contest. Uh, Barth carries the 20th century. Um, what Bart does is uh, provide a kind of what's often labeled neo-orthodoxy, sometimes called dialectical theology, though dialectical theology is probably more reference to early Bart than later Bart. Um, but neo-orthodoxy, I think, is a, is a valid title. Um, it's neo, of course, meaning new orthodoxy. Uh, what you have with Karl Barth and other figures following Bart, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is going to be the most important within the Lutheran. Uh, world, um, probably only most important, beca really because of the history surrounding his relationship to the Nazis, honestly, more than I tend to think that's probably the reason why Bonhoeffer so well known. I don't know that his theological work, he had some good work, but I don't know that his theological work uh, m probably merits the... As, as a figure, Bonhoeffer makes a big splash again because of his his fight against Nazism. And, you know, he had the interesting period in New York City. Um, tension that he's gotten. Uh, I think his, his story probably has popularized his writings more than it would have otherwise. But, okay, nonetheless. Um, so you have neo-orthodoxy, Emil Brunner, Karl Barth, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, kind of three big names there. But what they provide is a way to adopt some historical critical methodology of, of Protestant liberalism but rejecting the kind of moralism and anti-creedalism that you find within uh, Protestant liberalism. So it sees itself as a new way to be orthodox, a kind of mediating perspective then between the old Protestant liberalism and then the kind of st strict, rigorous, scholastic orthodoxy of people like me. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Karl Barth, um, he reacts largely against liberal theology and a lot of his his theological formulations are really driven by this rejection of or move against liberal theology. Um, so Barth is trained in Protestant, the, was the old Protestant liberalism under Adolf von Harnack at the University of Berlin. Now, we didn't discuss Harnack here in this particular series, 
Um, but if you're going to name kind of the, the three pillars of Protestant liberalism, uh, it's, it's often how I cat it. There are other figures as well, but I, I tend to think that there are three figures to really understand Protestant liberalism um, that are essential. And that's Schleiermacher, Ritual, and Harnack. And, and Harnack is just as key as these other individuals. So uh, at this time, at the beginning of, of the 20th century, Harnack is really the most significant Protestant liberal teacher. Uh, so Bart is is trained in the best of what was the Protestant liberal tradition uh, in Germany. Now it's helpful to remember that I mean this is German language centric and heavy. He's in Berlin. Now uh, Protestant liberalism, if you remember from the last program, uh, emphasizes, especially with ritual, but this has its basis in Schleiermacher, but uh, that this idea of, of a moral community. Um, the church is this kind of positive moral community. The kingdom of God is growing on this earth. There is a kind of optimism in Europe uh, about where the future is is headed. That ritual and, and various other figures, Protestant liberalism kind of fits into their notion of moral community, the kingdom of God. Um, this fits well with the cultural milieu of the 19th century, but in the 20th century, You've got World War I happening, and then World War II. Uh, but with World War I, a lot of that optimism that you find among Europeans is kind of dead. So it's very and, and it's interesting, again, Peterson's go-to... I mean, where, where does Peterson get this? He, he says it again and again and again. I've studied totalitarianism, and again, 20th century totalitarianism. And his go-to definition of hell is a an Auschwitz prison guard who likes his work very human sin becomes very clear when you have the development of you know the nuclear bomb and you have it just horrible acts of, of war and devastation and, and just death all around you the notion of moral community that you find in someone like a ritual no longer really spoke to the condition of man in the 20th century, a very bloody century. So Bart felt that when he became a pastor in his Protestant liberalism, he really didn't have anything to preach. There was not really much to offer to sinful man. When and again, this was a common story. Look at Abraham Kuyper's story. Uh, many people left, they were trained in this liberalism, and then they went into the real world of an actual church with real, real people who are um, suffering and dying and living and sinning and all of this stuff. And this, this, this liberal theology just sort of comes apart. When, we're, when the sin of man is very obvious in the outside world, and you have this kind of neo-Kantian theology philosophy that just it doesn't speak to people in, in their own situation as to where they're at, which is why you know, existentialism becomes popular at this, at this time because it speaks to that dread that we have looking at the devastation and destruction of the world around us. All right, uh, Bart has his uh, Romer brief, his Romans commentary, 1919, uh, that we're told is, is like a, what is it? A, a, like a bombshell in the court of the theologians or the, whatever the phrase is, now I'm forgetting <laughs> exactly what it is, but uh, but this is a, a commentary on Romans uh, that, and there are a couple editions of this commentary, but it ends up having kind of an explosive impact upon New Testament, not just New Testament scholarship, because it's not really much of a New Testament commentary. <laughs> it's not much of a commentary on Romans, really. Uh, it's kind of like Luther's Galatians commentary that, that it's part commentary, but largely it's no, he's, he's using the text. He's exactly, he's exactly right. Because I was, you know, when I started Romans, uh, a couple of people said, oh, have you looked at Bart's commentary on Romans? So I picked it up and I was like, this is not a commentary. It's a very interesting book, but it's not a commentary. Next to Romans to talk about the things he wants to talk about. And I love Luther's Galatians commentary, so don't, I don't necessarily mean that as an insult. But um, all right, so so this th this Romans commentary uh, becomes very influential among theologians. Everybody's reading it, everybody's commenting on it. And uh, there are a lot of points to talk about here, but I'm just going to summarize briefly. Uh, one point that is made throughout the Romans commentary is this profound discontinuity between God and man. So Bart is very insistent on the, the strong difference uh, between God and man. Um, he also takes sin seriously, and we have to start taking sin seriously when we're looking at world wars. So people start to, to 
think more seriously about the reality of sin. Whereas previous theologians kind of took that idea of original sin and kind of scoffed at it. It was kind of mythological or, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, maybe there's some truth to it, but uh, they didn't really emphasize the reality of human sin. So Bart is bringing human sin back into the picture as something to really take seriously. And Bart is reading Calvin, Bart is reading Luther, so he's reading. And of course, one of the things that we saw right away with, with Jordan was his sort of Augustinian anthropo and theological anthropology, which meant he, he, Jordan Peterson very much talks and believes about sin. The register of sin, again, listen to, go remember what he said to Pierce Morgan right there. I mean, that's, Jordan has been very consistent throughout the six years I've been listening to him. These are the registers that he speaks in a lot of reformation era sources and saying that they need to be actually taken seriously and not just dismissed as old things to be uh, rejected and overcome um, because we're so much smarter now than we used to be um, so bart's theology and and you know how does it relate to christology is what we're getting at but bart's theology is christocentric and regardless of how you interpret Bart, because there's a different interpretations of nearly everything Bart says, it seems, uh, everybody agrees that he is very Christ-centered. And, and he is echoing Luther in some ways in doing this. Um, many have argued that he goes... And again, with Peterson, even though he's still in the Old Testament, apparently he did a Sermon on the Mount series for his Peterson Academy. Uh, Peterson's fairly Christocentric in his sort of natural theology way. And he, again, he's following Jung. It was far beyond Luther, however, in, in that they would say that he is Christomonistic. So that's a criticism of Karl Barth, that he adopts a Christomonism. Christomonism would be essentially that everything is kind of conflated with Jesus. So that not only is Christ at the center of Christian proclamation and teaching, uh, but he has basically conflated everything into Christology. And, and so that's a criticism. Christomonism is not supposed to be a good thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so that's a criticism that's, that's often um, leveled. If you do want a Lutheran view of Bart and a Christocentric versus Christomonistic approach, uh, David Scare's little book on Christology interacts a bit with Karl Barth. Um, so that might be a good place to start if you want a Lutheran treatment. Um, all right. So what this Christocentric theology that Bart develops is ends up getting the label neo-orthodoxy. I don't think Bart came up with that label or really, I don't know that he himself used the label. I think it might've been one that was placed on him, though I, I can't recall <laughs> at the moment. So um, I, I'm not sure. Um, essentially though, this neo-orthodoxy tries to have a historical Christian orthodoxy. So a lot of the things of classical theology that had been uh, very much rejected by the older Protestant liberals, but still retains the Protestant liberal historical critical methodology. So people like Bart are arguing that the, the Bible is not inerrant. Uh, the Bible has plenty of historical errors. They're going to say that, you know, perhaps Moses didn't actually write the Pentateuch. They could have been written by multiple authors. Now, now again, this is even in these details, how the conversation is developing is super interesting because I was at a classical exam and the question got asked of inerrancy and I thought, well, this is gonna be interesting because of course, the entire project of biblical inerrancy has to do with the modernist framing of what an error is. And you know, there are three Isaiahs, all of this kind of stuff. So they can basically say um, that they are adopting many of the elements of this uh, historical critical uh, methodology, and that way they can still be kind of relevant to modern man. Um, however, they are still retaining a sense of classical, um, what are known as classical Christian Orthodox uh, beliefs. Okay, so how does this then relate to, to Christology? Well, for Bart, God is only known in Christ. And the the revelation of, of Christ or of God in the Christ event defines who God is for us. Okay, that kind of sounds right. <laughs> but but this also means for Bart that there was a rejection of natural theology. So there's this back and forth between Karl Barth and Emil Brunner. Emil Brunner is one of the other most significant figures within neo-orthodoxy. 
Um, now, natural theology has everything to do with, let's say, Romans 1, if you understand your Bible, and or, or even Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God day after day they pour forth spirits. How much can we know about God through what we call general revelation? And I've said many, many times, Peterson is all about general revelation. He's a scientist. Uh, where... Bruner and Bart, they both have essays they've written on natural theology, and Bart is just called, he says, nine, no to natural theology, uh, which is very well known among Bardians. Say nine, there is no natural theology because that's theology apart from Christ, apart from God's revelation in Christ. And so this is where you get some of these tensions because the, the, I almost said eschatological, that's in there. But the existentialism is sort of decontextualized, and that's sort of Boltman. And so it's in that, in that whether it's a psychedelic tri it's a psychedelic trip or it's a moment of transformation where we're sort of sucked out of time and we're, we're in a flow state, where it's sort of decontextualized. And well, the, the, it's just kind of there, apart, separate, disconnected, but of course, what the cognitive scientists and the psychologists and all them do, they're trying to knit in the physical world with those moments. And so even the, even the invention of the term flow state is, is all about hooking this all up together so the existentialism doesn't just go away. And that's where Peterson's work and the work of this little corner and John Verveke and, and Peugeot, that's where it's... It's sort of bringing it back in together to try and have it not be quite so existentialist, disconnected, disembodied, modernity floating up into nothing, but once again reconnected back in with the world. Uh, so for Bart, the natural world cannot reveal the reality of God to us. So we don't develop a natural theology. So classical theology... And that, of course, would be with Peterson is perhaps his main project is the physical world revealing God to us. Differentiates between a natural and supernatural theology or natural theology and revealed theology so that there are things about God that can be known just by contemplation of creation. Uh, and this is largely taken from Romans chapter one, where Paul says that things about God can be clearly seen uh, through nature. So classical theology says, uh, that we can know God's existence, you know, his, his power, his goodness there, you know, we can make philosophical proofs for the existence of God that actually work. However, that is, th that is not saving knowledge of God. Saving knowledge of God is only through supernatural revelation through Christ. Uh, but Bart adopts the latter view, but rejects the former. So he says there is no natural revelation at all. Now he does have his own exegesis of that text in Romans. So he, he, it's not like he ignores the text. I don't think he does it, deals with it well. <laughs> um, it, throughout the church dogmatics, if you look especially at the footnotes, Bart does tend to be very focused on the text. And he does have ways of arguing for all of his unique and often odd positions from the text. Um, but he's going to say, no, there is no natural theology. So this is where that part of that Christomonism comes in, that God is only in Christ, that you can't know God in any other way, um, so that there is no, no natural theology. Uh, Bart comes up with the... A, unique idea of election that is related to Christology so that he speaks about sometimes it's called a superlapsarianism which is it's so disconnected from historical superlapsarianism if you don't know what that is it's a it's a very high form of Calvinism um, but you can I don't know look it up on Wikipedia if you really want to know uh, but this is Jesus Jesus is considered both the elect one and the reprobate one. So he basically says, and this is again part of Christomonism, to say that, well, everything is just Jesus. So election is also just Jesus. Revelation is just Jesus, right? So Jesus is the elect one. He is the chosen one, but he's also the reprobate one. So he's reprobate for us. He, us he's both accepted uh, as elect and rejected on the cross as reprobate. So there is a kind of double predestinarian Calvinist type language, but it's applied to Christ on the cross. So he, he, even though he's, he comes from a Swiss reformed background, so there is Calvinistic influence on his thought. There's Calvinistic language that he uses, um, but it's not identical with what you find in something like the three forms of unity of the Westminster Confession. Bart goes in very different directions. Now, some of the language 
that he he uses here uh, is it appears to be universalistic. Um, so some of Bart's language about Christ and the redemptive work of Christ sounds as if what he's saying is all people are already reconciled to God so that there is no more need to be reconciled to God. Um, and he, he's going beyond a universal objective justification in like the Lutheran sense that, um, and I've got a program on that if you want to learn about that. But uh, so, but I know some people will say that's kind of just what Lutherans are already doing. So uh, there is some universal language in Lutheranism as well that Calvinists would say leans toward universalism, though we reject that. Um, but Bart really does seriously t seem to sound like a universalist, though when he's explicitly asked about it, he says he's not. So it's not quite clear exactly where he stands on that. And like everything else in Bart, there's debate about his relationship to universalism. Okay. Um, Let's see. Then uh, claims of Christomonism I have here on my notes, but we've already talked about that. Uh, Jesus as uh, the Word of God. This is a major theme in in Karl. Okay, we'll leave we'll leave we'll leave Karl Barth alone. But but again, what's interesting is is where Peterson is sort of at with respect of these things. How he's in some ways he's he's in the environment but you're seeing through these individuals the story continue to turn and it's it's you know you'll see this more in Peugeot because of course because of course Jonathan is sort of he he's connected in with the historical Christianity but he's aware of the postmodernity he came you know, he came to orthodoxy through post-modernity, sort of all the way through. And Jordan, of course, is in, in some sense still in the political realm and in the popular realm. And in that sense, more like a 20th century neo-orthodox figure um, in the way that public theologians were. And, and of course, all of this public theologian language has to do with the relationship between the thinker and the broader society, especially one in which now in, this is so hard because at least since the 20th century, I'm not going to talk about the 19th or 18th century because well, it, it, these things are so difficult to sort of figure out. The church as institution is so weak. The church, I mean, the Pope to a degree, um, I mean, does Joe Biden, how much, how much thought does Joe Biden really give Gosh, I don't want to just step into this whole Roman Catholic fight. I was going to say, how much thought does Joe Biden actually give to what the Pope thinks? But then again, um, <laughs> all the debate around this Pope, which I'm not going to get into because I'm not Roman Catholic. I'll let you all have that fight. But again, I thought I thought Jordan B. Cooper's talk here covering Boltmann and Bart and to a degree Bruner um, really helps sort of contextualize Peterson in this question. So, um, yeah, this one was pretty nerdy. I don't know if you find it interesting or not. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think.